Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss reproductive barriers and speciation, so let's jump right in. In 1955, biologist W. Frank Blair published a study in which he studied two species of American frog, Microhyla olivacea, which is distributed across the western U.S., and Microhyla carolinensis, which is distributed across the eastern U.S. These two are called narrowmouth frogs. As it happens, both species overlap in an area that is a strip running from the Gulf of Mexico to northeastern Oklahoma, and the hybrids are occasionally found. Though there are some small morphological differences between the two species, M. carolinensis is modeled while M. olivacea isn't, the important difference between the two species is their call. Frog calls are typically species specific because males of different species will often go to the same pools to find females. The best way to find a female you're genetically compatible with is to have a call that allows her to identify you specifically, and not some other species. Birds, too, often have species-specific calls. Now, as we pondered in the previous video, should the two species of microhyla be considered separate even though they can hybridize? Most researchers think so, in large part because they have different calls. The calls of M. olivacea are about twice as long as those of M. carolinensis and are much higher pitched. The calls of hybrid microhyla are directly intermediate between both species, but something very interesting is going on here. The microhyla calls are more different between the species where the two overlap compared to where they don't. Why might it be the case that the microhyla calls in Arizona and Florida are more similar to each other when they're separated by a continent versus the extremely different calls of the two microhyla species living in the same area. The reason is called behavioral isolation, which is a prezygotic reproductive barrier. That means it's a barrier that prevents the formation of a zygote. Understand that when a species begins splitting in two or more populations, the incipient populations are still very similar to each other. Oftentimes, the populations may become geographically separated and while they're separated, they can accrue genetic differences. These differences may help the populations adapt to their novel environments, but many differences may simply result from the accumulation of neutral variations. When the two incipient species eventually come into contact with each other again, enough generations may have passed where, while they are still able to mate, hybridization may be penalized. In the instance of microhyla, the hybrids have intermediate calls in both length and pitch compared to both parental species. This is problematic because it means the hybrid is behaviorally unattractive to both species, so the hybrid dies without offspring if it is fertile at all. To mitigate the chances of producing behaviorally unattractive offspring, microhyla that produce species-specific calls are positively selected in areas where producing hybrids is possible. This selective pressure is, of course, relaxed in areas where producing hybrids doesn't occur, which is why the calls become more similar to each other the further one gets from the hybrid zone. The process of natural selection magnifying the differences between two species that co-occur in some area is called character displacement. It's been witnessed in a variety of species from mollusks to mammals, including even the Galapagos finches. David Lack famously observed that the beak sizes of Geospes affordis and G. fuliginosa are nearly identical where the two don't co-occur. However, their beak sizes are drastically different where they do. 
Related to character displacement is the question of whether incipient species tend to develop their morphological and ecological differences while they are separated or while they are competing in the same area. A recent study found evidence for the latter hypothesis. Evidently, divergences in character become much more prominent when incipient species secondarily co-occur. This echoes the competitive exclusion principle in ecology, which proposes that species competing for the same resources are ecologically unstable. Unless other factors are at play, such situations tend to result in one species dominating the ecological niche. Alternatively, species evolve to make use of different resources, or using the resources in a different manner, thereby avoiding direct competition with each other. This example also gets at the heart of what underlies the process of speciation, the formation of pre- and post-zygotic barriers. Pre-zygotic barriers are things that prevent the formation of a zygote, and post-zygotic barriers prevent an individual from reproducing after a zygote has formed. Examples of prezygotic barriers include ecological, mechanical, and gametic isolation, while examples of postzygotic barriers include hybrid inviability or sterility, ecological inviability, and behavioral sterility. Ecological isolation means that two species do not mate due to differences in their ecological niches, such as living in different habitats or spawning at different times of the year. Mechanical isolation refers to two individuals being physically incapable of mating, think, but not too hard, of the Great Dane and Chihuahua. Lastly, gametic isolation is when the gametes of two species are able to physically come in contact or in close proximity to each other, but mechanisms are in place that prevent them from fusing to form a zygote. For example, the mammalian egg cell is surrounded by an extracellular matrix called the zona pellucida. This forms a barrier that contains proteins allowing it to specifically recognize and bind onto species-specific sperm cells, whereas sperm cells from other species won't pass this barrier. Researchers are able to remove the zona pellucida, which permits the fertilization of hamster egg cells with human sperm, which is most often done to test sperm fertility. The resulting zygote isn't allowed to continue embryological development, and even if it would, it wouldn't be viable. As for postzygotic barriers, this includes hybrid inviability, where hybrids suffer developmental difficulties, possibly causing early death, perhaps right after the zygote has formed. For example, when two species are unable to mate due to too many genetic differences. Perhaps one species possesses 54 chromosomes, while a second possesses 46. The mismatch between chromosome sets in the fertilized ovum could cause the zygote to be terminated. Even if the hybrid is viable, postzygotic barriers can still occur later in the life cycle, which includes hybrid sterility. In this case, even if the hybrid survives to reproductive age, it is unable to reproduce. A mule a male donkey and female horse hybrid is probably the most famous example of the latter. Generally, during hybridization, heterogametic offspring, the sex possessing two different sex chromosomes like XY in mammals and flies, are more likely to be sterile than homogametic offspring, or XX in mammals and flies, a trend which has been termed Haldane's rule. Ecological inviability means that the hybrid will be intermediate in its ecological niche between the parents, which is maladaptive since the parental species have already been pushed by selection to separate adaptive peaks. And finally, behavioral sterility means that hybrids cannot obtain mates. This could be due to a hybrid exhibiting intermediate behaviors between the parental species. As you might guess, no single isolating barrier defines species. Instead, different combinations of isolating barriers separate species. These isolating barriers don't always follow a specific sequence in the evolution of every new species. Speciation is a very complex process. Sometimes it is relatively fast, 
or it takes place across timescales too large to be observed within a single lifetime. Speciation is also not a process that progresses inevitably towards some goal. Speciation may never result in complete isolation, and other times the process completely reverses with the breakdown of reproductive barriers. Even though in taxonomy species are treated as if they are distinct boxes, we should view species and the process of speciation as continuums. And just like with the speciation continuum, we find in nature species that have varying numbers of isolating barriers. On one extreme, some species pairs have just a single isolating barrier, whereas on the other, many barriers separate two species. An example of the former, two co-occurring species of ladybird beetle were reared on their natural host plants under lab conditions. One beetle, Epilacna nipponica, prefers to feed on thistle, Circium chemshaticum, while the other, E. yasutomii, feeds on blue cohosh, Colophyllum robustum. The researchers observed no behavioral isolation or hybrid inviability or sterility, indicating that evidently the only isolating mechanism is which host is preferred. Moving slightly along the isolation continuum, four species of the sea urchin Echinometra co-occur around Hawaii, but hybrids are very rare among them. The predominant isolating mechanism seems to be gametic isolation, but with weak ecological isolation and hybrid inviability and or sterility too. As one might expect, pre- and post-zygotic barriers increase with divergence between species. For example, in Mormirid fish, the differentiation of electric sexual cues increases with phylogenetic distance. Likewise, male songs of the Australian field cricket, Teleagrillus, become more different with phylogenetic distance. And in both stalk-eyed flies and centrarchids, hybrid sterility is correlated with phylogenetic distance. So, that's the narrowmouth's tail. Speciation occurs as a result of building reproductive barriers between populations, and there are many types of such barriers. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.